Welcome to the podcast, Phil. Mate, thanks for coming along. Uh, now, you work in the nuclear industry. Can you tell me a little That's bit correct, about, yeah. what, about what you do, please, mate? Yeah. So what do I do? Uh, at the moment, I'm working in Abu Dhabi. Um, it, sorry, I should say the United Arab Emirates, it, because it's a, it's a big collection of, of seven, what were originally seven tribes, and they came together to form the United Arab Emirates. Um, I'm working in the Emirate of Abu Dhabi. I'm living in Abu Dhabi, but most of my work is at the new nuclear plant, which is at Baraka, which is right down near the Saudi border. It's about 300 kilometers away from here. Uh, 300 kilometers, I normally, but at the moment, of course, I've been here on lockdown for a month. Normally, on every Sunday morning, I get in the car at 6.30 and I drive. Yep. Uh, the road is great, three, four lanes uh, each carriageway, um, 160 km, kilometers an hour speed limit. 160? 100, mi 100 miles an hour. <laughs> That would um, be fun. <laughs> I have a, a, a drive a Range Rover Sport, 4.4 liter, supercharged, and away you go. Nice. Um, so I do that journey twice a week. Uh, in between times, we live in, a, in a, a, a new city. It's a new city that was probably built, I think it started in about 1967, 68, uh, when, when big oil refinery was first built in a, a small town called Ruace. was a village at that time, Ruais. Um, so we, they have accommodation there. And it's a bit like a, probably a, a three or four star holiday camp. Really? Yeah. They, pro they provide our food, there's a gym. Uh, down in the city, there's a, a good recreation center with a couple of swimming pools. But of course, it's right, right on the coast. And the coast is a wonderful coast. It's, it's completely unadulterated down there. Um, so, so I've spent many, many a, a happy day, rest days, because we only work four days a week, um, down with some guys, good Australian friend, uh, kite surfing. Nice. Now, for me, I, I very soon realized that I'm too old for kite surfing, so I was I was the sensible guy on the beach, and I used to help them land their kite kites and uh, set kites up and pack kites away. So it was always good fun. Mm -hmm. But that's so that's the, the leisure side of, of the work. I started in the industry in 1978. Prior to that, I did a an apprenticeship, a technician's apprenticeship in the oh, it was a munitions factory in the UK, um, qualified as a draftsman, but very soon found that there were other, other opportunities available. So I uh, went to Germany and worked as a welding in inspector for two contracts, which was good. Mm -hmm. um, came back to the UK, um, eventually got married, as you do. And I joined the nuclear industry at Hinkley Point B Nuclear Power Station in 19, April 1978. Okay. So April the, April the 4th, what are we now? Yeah, so a little bit, little bit more than uh, 42 years ago. You still remember the exact date. Very nice. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, so I worked as a, a mechanical engineer, mainly on turbines. On what was referred to is a, a, a type of technology, a Magnox nuclear plant. And after four years, I moved over to an advanced gas cooled reactor, um, which was on the same facility, but it was, a, it was a new technology that actually came onto the onto production in uh, late nineteen late nineteen seventies, early nineteen eighties. It was good work, enjoyed the work, um, became more involved with the operational side uh, and became a, a team leader. So we had a, a multifunction team uh, made up of uh, reactor for health physicists, environmental technicians, um, 
operations technicians and maintenance technicians. I uh, did that for a while. Um, I became interested, I became a, a trade union representative. It was one of those things that it was the only way you could actually find out what was going on. And not that I'm, I'm particularly, um, I'm not a normal, what you consider a normal troublemaking type of trade union representative, you know, that's, that's how people see them. And uh, we worked, we did a lot of work in collaboration with the management. It was at a time when the nuclear industry was heavily subsidized by the, com by the government and the subsidies were being removed. So we had to become far more self-supporting. A lot of work was done. Um, we started to introduce things like skill broadening and, and all the frameworks that associated that, you know, which would, that which would provide, a, per se, an, an operator who has no technical background to be able to safely perform an isolation of a, a piece of equipment. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, took some time, took quite a, quite a bit of time, really interesting work. Um, that's, that was brought up to about 1998, 1999, and then I was asked to join the, the training function where uh, my first job was to revise the apprentice training program, which had fallen into, into some sort of uh, quagmire, in fact. You know. So we, we started to do some work with the, the apprentice program and local colleges. But at that same time, as an industry, we started to become more interested in uh, what at that time was HU, human performance. That, that, was, that was the abbreviation HU. Why HU? Hmm, God, I don't know. <laughs> Human I performance. H HP was taken, I guess. <laughs> HP was taken. That's the reason why. <laughs> um, and I, I became involved and I delivered all of the, the HU program, the foundation program, for about eight years. But along with that was also um, team-specific or role-specific sessions that we delivered and also leadership development sessions that we delivered and of course it, at that time human performance was really about how people interacted with daily work and technology so the foundation we would talk about communication we would talk about stress we would talk about how sleep affected the way you work about your, your age, your capabilities, and, and it was really good stuff, really good stuff, really enjoyable. Yeah. Um, then, continued doing that, and, and probably until, that wasn't the only thing I did, I also managed the compliance, the training compliance for our, our department, or sorry, for our plant, and then became involved in a project of managing the compliance for the whole of the nuclear fleet in the UK. Sure. It came to 2012, where my wife had been had been ill at that time, and I had the opportunity to to take retirement. But I was offered the position of a human performance coach on a a new construction, new nuclear construction project in the UK. Um, an opportunity that I jumped at. That was yeah. in, in 20 late 2011 early 2012 but unfortunately the contract sat on a table in an office in london probably right behind that bus seat that you have right behind your head <laughs> somewhere <laughs> an office in the in pall mall in london um, oh, no. be, because of finance finance for the for the project um, so i spent four years doing as little as I could in terms of, of work, spent four years riding my horses, two horses every day, which was great. And, and I had some, you know, work, some consultancy work, but it was, it was not much. It was, not, it was certainly not enough to sustain me. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
but at the same time, I was I was able to do a lot of a lot of studying, a lot of learning, and starting to understand how the world was changing. Then in May of 2016, I started working for the Hinkley Point C construction project as a nuclear safety culture specialist, delivering nuclear safety culture sessions to the supply chain. So I was, I was delivering sessions about nuclear safety culture to people who knew absolutely nothing about it. Yep. Uh, whether they be uh, the managing director of a, a tier one, tier two, or tier three contract organization, or a groundsman, right. a ground worker. Yeah. Um, and it was good. I did it for about 18 months until uh, I, I, remember, I remember vividly uh, at that time, construction industry, safety within the construction industry was not particularly great. And uh, a a guy that you probably will have heard of, Dr. John Green. I have, yes. Uh, a Scotsman. Uh, so I, I wrote to John. I said, John, he at that time was the head of HSEQ for Balfour, sorry, not for Balfour Beta, I can't remember who it was he was working for at that time, but they were part of the of the joint venture uh, the, who, along with the French company, uh, Bourguise. And uh, I said, John, we have a great opportunity where we can, working together, we can see some opportunities to improving the culture, the safety culture within the construction industry. I've been, by this time, I've been working, delivering these sessions three times a week to different groups all the way across the supply chain. And I could see the interest there. You know, they were really, really buying into this. And I sat down with John and one of his, his guys in the motorway services. And we, we, we spoke for about an hour. Um, John gave me his version of how Safety 2 came about. And I said, John, I've been delivering some workshops to some of your contract managers this last week, and they're really buying into it. And the big question they had was, how would they be able to take this forward? How would they be able to work with this? I said, I'm really interested in your view. And John's view was nuclear safety culture. This is a construction project. We're not going to need to be worrying, worrying about nuclear safety for another five or six years. Yep. And I thought, wow, you know, it was a great opportunity missed. Um, never had the opportunity to speak to him again about it, but at some point in the future, I will do. Um, I, at that time, my Bible was an IAEA the International Atomic Energy Authority guidance document, safety guidance document, nuclear safety culture in pre-refueling pre or pre-fueling stages of nuclear power plant construction. And it said, talked about the importance of embedding the culture right at the very beginning. Right at the very beginning. Reminded me of a, a discussion I had at one of these workshops. And... A groundsman, a, a ground worker, came in. We had 10 minutes or so at the, before the start of the session. And these were full one-day sessions, they're full long, long day sessions. And he said, why am I here? What is, what is it to do with me? You know, I'm, all I do is dig foundations. I said, well, give me 10 minutes. Give me 10 minutes. If after 10 minutes you feel that this isn't for you. It's not worth it. You're yeah. not going to you're not going to learn anything from this, then I'll sign the attendance sheet to say that you've attended. You can go and you can do whatever you want to do for the rest of the day. Fine. So I said, have you ever, ever heard of the Oroville Dam? No, no, no. Okay. So Oroville Dam, Northern California, 2016, January 2016. Very, very heavy rains caused the Oroville Dam to flood. This was a dam that had been finished several years before, but it had never faced this sort of barrage. 
we got to the point where the flood waters were so high that it was going over the 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 wall of the dam, which was an, a natural wall, soil and stone. It was never envisaged that it would have to hold back the the water, and it got to a point where there were there was some real concern because the water was going over and it was beginning to erode the, the base of the dam itself. So they decided that they would have to open the emergency slipway. So this is a concrete path, probably 15 meters wide, yeah. that would guide the excess water down into the Oroville River, take it through the city of Oroville safely away. So they opened it up. Four hours after they opened up the, the slipway, a sinkhole opened up underneath. Ooh. 40 meters wide, 30 meters deep. Ooh. And the water was coming straight out, going straight down, eroding the, the foundation of the dam itself. Caused the evacuation of five, four or 5,000 people in the city of Oroville. He put his hand up. The guy, the foundation worker said, okay, you've got me. Yeah, I understand what I understand why I'm here. The foundations um, are important. Yes, foundations are as important as every other part of the, of the facility. Yeah, mm. yeah. So you yeah, had so him, you had him hooked. That's good. You got him in. He was he was there. Yeah. So we continued with this until um, August, July, August of 2017, and. I'd heard rumours, you know, rumours that they, they were cutting back on costs. And then I was told, Phil, they pulled the budget. They pulled the budget. They decided that Balfour BT have got some behavioural safe, safe, behavioral based safety guys and they will deliver the nuclear safety culture workshops. Okay. I thought, wow. At that time, I'd already been asked if I would be interested in coming out to, out to the Emirates to this project. Um, so I, I, saw, I saw the criteria that, 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 that had to be met for the jobs that I was, I was going to be doing in the future. And these, they were talking about giving nuclear safety culture to someone who never worked in the nuclear industry before. So, so disappointing. I came out um, in September. September 2017, I came here um, eventually. Um, the onboarding process was a long, long process, getting security and security clearance and so on. Um, yeah. But yeah, came here, and for the first month, I thought, oh my, what have I let myself in for? Um, it was a very, very different culture. Very different culture. Um, were you? Was it primarily Emiratis that you were working with, or was it expats as well? So, so the work, the work part wasn't. It wasn't the work part at first. It was the way that things were done, you know, in in, in the Emirates themselves. So you go, they take your passport. Um, they they have to put, put the visa in. You have to be have a medical check. You have to get your Emirates ID, and all that takes about a month. Mm -hmm. So for a month, you can't go anywhere. You can't hire a car, you can't book into a hotel, you've got no passport, no ID, uh, anything like that at all. And it was, and I thought, my, you know. So it, I overcame it was, uh, that it, eventually. It, it was social isolation before it became popular. <laughs> yeah, it certainly was social isolation, yeah, yeah. Um, but then starting to to get involved with the work, mm -hmm. and and that has been such an education, such an education. So over the course of of the last two and a half years, just over two and a half years, I've delivered nuclear safety culture workshops twice a week, uh, eight hours long each workshop, and the the first part, the morning session talked about various aspects of culture and, and, and the impacts and you know, the positives and negatives of culture. And then in the afternoon, we have a, a focus group. So each 
class would normally be about 16 people. And for me, I would, I would class these as like a, a forerunner for a, an undocumented learning team. Yep. Because these typically, we would have four or five different cultures in attendance. And it was really great to understand or begin to understand how different people saw the world. And we only see the world through our own cultural glasses. The biggest challenge, I think yeah, the, the biggest challenge has been with the Americans. Most of the, the because, because of the decision made early by the Emirati government that they wanted this to be aligned with the Western nuclear industry, they aligned with IMPO and WANO. So IMPO, the Institute of Nuclear Power Operators, um, that was a body that was put together after Three Mile Island. You heard of Three Mile Island? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yep. So IMPO was formed by the industry after Three Mile Island. And they started to realize that they needed to, to standardize what they were doing across all of their nuclear plants, independently owned and run nuclear power plants across the states. And they put together some really good work, did some really good work. And more latterly through the, the 19, um, as, we, as we go through the time, you think uh, Three Mile Island, um, Dave Woods was involved as a psychologist back in those days. Yep. And then when you, you think of uh, were other works, Jens Rasmussen talking about his local rationality, James Reason through, through the 90s talking about systems, systems thinking, systems engineering. Yep. And James Reason eventually, he got no traction in the UK, the UK nuclear industry, he didn't want to listen to him at all. So he went to the States and he did a lot of work, a lot of work through the 1990s. And one of the, one of the things that sticks in my mind as being um, one of the real positives that came was he and a guy called Tony Mushara, who worked for Impo. They were, they were the two guys who were responsible for the five principles of human performance. Now, humans are fallible. Yep. The first one. And, and that was the start of it for us. And, and the nuclear industry at that time, we were during the early 2000, 2002, seen as, as forerunners. In, in this brave new world. But then it changed, sadly, sadly. So I found in the UK, we, we were generally, we were making progress. We were learning and we were just about managing to stay away from the punitive society that, uh, many wanted yeah we still talked about yeah human error but we were still prepared to to think let's look beyond why did why did so and so make the mistake yeah. and i remember an issue we had with a guy who he uh paul his name is paul can i tell stories oh, please do yes <laughs> so 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 paul was a cni technician and um, one of his jobs, I say one of his jobs, there were only two or three people who carried out this work, which was guideline testing. So that's testing the, the control systems for the control rods themselves mm -hmm. to make sure that, that when power was lost, they would drop in and control the reactor or yep. shut down the reactor, I should say. AKA a a what went wrong with Chernobyl. Yeah. Sort of. Sort, sort of, of yeah. yeah. Sort very, of, yeah. Very general, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, um, why there were only two or three people? Well, they, they had to train online. So if someone made a mistake, they tripped the reactor. So, yeah, terrible situation to put a guy in. Um, but there were, there were two or three who did the work regularly. Paul was one of these guys. Paul went into work one morning and his colleagues, they, yeah, they recognised there was there was something 
you know, he was a bit quiet, but never challenged him, never questioned him, and off they went. Uh, this was some work that always was always carried out by two people together. Mm -hmm. So peer checking, but uh, uh, some work optimization studies had identified that there was some work that could be removed. Uh, no peer check was required for a particular task. So that meant that they could split the guys up and one could go on a different floor and they'd be separate, speed, speed the process up, et cetera, et cetera. One particular part of the process following the procedure was for Paul to have gone into an annex to check that an indicator was lit. He failed to do that. Contacted his colleague, said, yeah, okay, you can proceed. He proceeded, tripped the reactor. So a normal reactor trip would typically cost uh, three to five million pounds. So it, it, enough, enough to, to cause serious concern. What, what but, does that actually mean? What does trip the reactor actually mean? So, so that means that all the control rods drop in and the reactor stops generating. Yep. Now, of course, there are safety implications. Any, any transients up and down through power or they are they are a, a potential impact upon safety, but the real issue is the cost. Yeah. But the real issue in this case was not just the cost, the normal cost associated with the reactor trip, but it was to do with the fact that the safety case that allowed the reactor to run did not allow the reactor to start up because some work had been omitted from. The, one of the previous outages, or the previous outage, I should say. So that meant that that work had to be done. That meant that that reactor was offline for nearly a month. That meant that that total cost that was attributed okay. to Paul Trippin the reactor was thirty-one million pounds over an indicator light. Hmm. Over an indicator light. Right. So I was I was sat down with because I was his representative. I was sat down with. Uh, the the station director Nigel, and he's. I said, "Well, what are you going to do then?" He said, "Well, I've, I've been told I've got to get rid of him." Why? He said, "Well, I've got to be seen to be doing something. And that's that satisfying that emotional yep. thing inside, you know, from a management perspective." Yep. So, okay, let's think about it. You get rid of him. Is anyone else going to make the same mistake? And Nigel knew exactly where I was going because Nigel was a good guy. Um, I said, well, let's, let's look through what we could have done as an industry, as a, as a plant to, to prevent that from happening. For a start, David, his line manager, didn't see him in the morning. In fact, David hadn't seen him for three days. They're, they're, they were so relaxed within their team that it... David felt it was, you know, I can trust them, they're going to go on the job. But then he looked him in the eye, he would have known there was something not quite right with, with Paul. The peer check for the, the checking of the indicator light was one of the tasks that was taken out of the, through the work optimization. Yep. The fact that there were only three guys led to that complacency. When, if you were test, if you were actually training in the simulator, along with the reactor operators, it, cost, it would cost £100,000, that was the, the estimated cost, to have upgraded the simulator to allow them to test the guard lines in there. And I said, well, do, you, do you know the real reason? Do you know why Paul was distracted? Because that's what it was, a distraction. His seven-year-old daughter was taken into intensive care last night. There you go. Yep. These are the conditions that you, you try to work out beforehand, right? I was going to ask you, yeah, was it stress, fatigue, time pressure? There you go. That's, yeah, that's a big that's one. It. And so Paul ended up as a, um, with a letter on his file for failing to follow the procedure, which is fine. Okay. Um, he he, he recognised that. He should have followed the procedure. He was wrong. Um, we then did put other measures in place. They still didn't allow the the, uh, the CNI technicians to train on the on the uh, simulator facility because of the the troubles they had 
the difficulties they had meeting their, their own operational training requirements. They really need another, another simulator, really. But um, yeah, yeah. So from a, a management perspective, we were beginning to move away from the, the, the punitive state. When I moved over here, I was faced then with the um, human performance, human errors. I have, a, I have a, a line manager who talks about nothing but HU tools, HU tools, HU tools. Oh, you know, we've got to take that step beyond HU tools. HU tools are good. They have their place. But, but we've got to be looking beyond the reason why we want the guys to use the tools all the time and, and fix the systems. So to do that, we need to get talking to the people. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that it's in itself that has a, has its challenges because we have somewhere between forty and sixty different nationalities. One of the exercises I do on our on our workshops is: Have you heard of Gerd Hofstede? Uh, a little bit, yes. I have heard something. So, so Gerd Hofstede, uh, a Dutch organizational psychologist. He did a lot of studies through the, the 1980s and 90s and continues with the studies, talking about all the behaviors that we as individuals exhibit all sit in, into typical boxes. Mm -hmm. And he was able to put these, pull these boxes dimensions. So he started off with five dimensions of a, of a culture. Um, by culture, it could be like a family group, a, a, a local community, um, an organization or even a country to that extent and uh, the exercise I do focuses on two of these these um, dimensions of culture so the power of distance and individualism and collectivism okay. so when I look at, at the cultures that we have present we have we have Americans are probably the, the biggest Western culture, followed by English, Swedish, Belgians, French, Italians, um, Polish, Romanians, yep. uh, Spanish also. We have quite a big Spanish mafia. Um, and then over on the other side, you have, or in the middle, you have the, the Arab cultures. From the Emiratis, mm -hmm. there, there are Iranians, Iraqis, um, Egyptians, Jordanians, and then moving beyond there, we have the constructors who are the Koreans. Right. Yep. And and the labour that is supporting the Korean construction, typically uh, Bangladeshi, Indian, Indians, yep. Pakistani, uh, Nepalese. Supporting all of those, the Philippines and Thais as well. Excuse me. There are, there are quite a considerable number of, of those, those cultures. And when you look across that broad spectrum, whether you're looking for the individualism and collectivism or the power of distance, we have, we have both extreme ends of, of both of those dimensions there present. And the biggest challenge is associated with the American culture, or I say the American culture, the, the traits, the info traits of a healthy nuclear safety culture, which the industries, the Western industry is measured against, requires people to speak openly and honestly, have a quite strong, healthy questioning attitude. You're not going to get that in, in a high power distance no. organization at all. Yeah. It's just not something, something that's done. It's disrespectful for me to question my superior. He knows far more than I do, you know, and that's, that's the attitude. Um, the other thing is the sharing of bad news. Very, very um, strong collective organizations, family groups, societies, don't share bad news publicly. That's all, you know, why, why do I need to, why do we need to share that with other people? That's our business. Yeah, 
And yeah, that could be a big had... problem because then the things that are going wrong aren't discussed. And they're, they're, not, discussed. they're not fixed. Yeah. No. That's quite scary. Yeah. It is. It is. Um, within, I think, 2014 or 2016, 2016, one of the Korean plants had a total, a total loss of power. Mm-hmm. Now, if you think total loss of plow, power, that was what actually led to the, the issues at uh, Fukushima Daiichi. Yep. Mm-hmm. Total loss of power caused a loss of cooling. And they were unable to control the Unable react- the to control the reactivity. Mm-hmm. So in uh, one of the, the Korean plants, they had a total loss of power for 20 minutes. Right. Okay, they restored it within 20 minutes, but they didn't want to share that with the rest of the world. Mm-hmm. Their immediate response was, well, that's our business. We don't need to share that with, with anyone. That's ours. Thankfully, they did. Um, and so, so that in itself is a, is a real, really interesting and really challenging part of, of our work. Yeah. Was that um, was that investigated that Korean one as to why? Oh yeah, yeah. how it What what was the background there? So it was um, it, it was to do with a, a a loss of power from the grid. Okay, because they take the power, they supply electricity to the grid, and they take the power from the grid. So it's to do with the loss of power from the grid and the failing of a backup system. Yep. Okay. Um, so so yeah, they 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 sorted it. It wasn't. It wasn't the issue was that they didn't feel it was necessary to share that information. That was the real problem. And without, so a, good, the, without a good reporting culture, you're uh, you're in big trouble. Yeah. Yeah, if, absolutely. It's 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 an essential requirement. Yeah. And that's probably I have to be really careful about what I say because um, about our own industry. Yeah, I don't need to get you in trouble industry. at all tonight, mate. At all. <laughs> But some some of the I would talk about some of the challenges. Some of the challenges are are the mannerisms of, of us as Westerners, for example, particularly Americans. Americans they they come with a view that their way is the only way. Mm-hmm. Um, they're one of the other cultural dimensions was short term or long term short term orientation. And the Americans very much short term orientation. Come on, let's get the job done. Let's get this done. Let's get this finished. Mm-hmm. And that approach to a Korean is because yeah. the Koreans are very, very peaceful people. You know, they yeah. they don't like well, I say South Koreans are very, very peaceful people. They don't like to to have any form of, of friction whatsoever. And the Americans find it really difficult because they think that they're being very secretive. Right. But in reality, it's, it's not about being secretive. It's about not wanting to show themselves up to be in any way inadequate. Mm-hmm. When they're dealing with... English is, is the preferred language on, on the plant itself. So we have all these Koreans, you know, 30, 40, 50-year-old Koreans are trying to learn to speak English now. Yeah, yeah. You have all these different American representatives from different states, you know, from the deep south coming over, and even I can't understand what they're saying. Uh, and it, it does pose up some challenges for them. And what the Americans struggle to, to manage, really, is some humility. That, that's probably the biggest failing, and, I, and that's the one thing I tell them. You, know, you must, you have to show humility, because you come across as being so aggressive. Well, and in the normal communications, it's really, it really is a challenge for them. Yeah. They're, they're results focused. That's what they want. They want to see the result and the outcome, and they want that to be successful. Uh, and they're not oh, yeah. prepared to face when something goes wrong. Time extends. Uh, the cost extends that sort of thing. They're not they're not prepared for that as much as others would be. No, no. So um, we've had numerous occasions where you know the you'll be you'll be shown a, a presentation slide and all the indicators are green or blue, whichever good whichever is good, blue or green. 
And you think, wow, you, know, you really are so naive to think that you know, if all your indicators are, are blue or green or red or, or whatever, whatever's good, then it means that something, someone's not telling you something somewhere. And you need to find that out. And, and that's, that's probably one of the biggest challenges. So at the moment, we're beginning to go through a, a transition. Mm-hmm. So one of, my, one of my challenges has been over the course of the last six weeks, I'm, I'm in, responsible for the nuclear safety culture training for the plant. And it's what do we do? How do we do? How do we deliver it for the future? Um, do we require an, an expat nuclear professional who's been in the industry for 30 years to come and sit through this workshop? You know, some, some of them say, well, no, come on, I've been, I know all there is to know about nuclear safety. My argument is, yeah, yeah, you may do, may do, in, in the States. But you're not in the States now. This is, this is a very different environment. You're not working with people who are all from the States. You're working with people who are from very, very different, diverse backgrounds. And it's, so I've had to recognize that the, there may be some, some of the way that we've been doing it for the last few years. Uh, but the one bit I did omit to say was why we had to introduce this program. We had a, a WANO evaluation, World Association of Nuclear Operators. They came and they evaluated many aspects of, of where we are with our processes and so on in 2016. And they identified that there were some, there were many shortcomings associated with nuclear safety culture. That's why the measures were put in place. Uh, but we're now having to, to revise what we do. So we're, we're putting together targeted training, specifically targeted training for particular groups of people. Um, leaders, for example. Leaders training that will be focusing on them understanding the realities of work, as Stephen Shorrock talks, yep. uh, you know, the, the messy realities of work. During the workshops, I, I quite often I will ask, do you believe that people follow procedures? And almost to a man, the Americans will say, well, yes. Well, do you really believe that? And then very slowly they'll say, well, yeah, not all the time. And, and I say, well, do you understand why people don't follow procedures? You know, what processes do you have lead, as leaders put in place to, to find out why people, you know people don't follow procedures, but why? And so, so we're now starting some, putting some steps in place that, that will help educate them. Uh, doing, doing some work with psychological safety. Um, other, other different groups we have some, some different challenges with. But uh, the, main, the main work is with, with our own nuclear performance improvement people mm-hmm. who come from the states where my my argument has been recently i said well you know i've spoken to our lawyers and asked them how often do they have to update their knowledge and they'll say well every two or three years and i've spoken to our ict guys how often do you have to up, update your technical knowledge said, well every three or three or four months right here we are Nuclear safety, nuclear safety, human performance specialists. How often do we update our knowledge? Most of you have done nothing within the last 20 years. No. And that's true. They're doing the same thing now that they were doing 20 years ago. They don't talk about these, these things that, that we're beginning to talk about now. You know, with safety, safety too. Mm-hmm. Uh, high reliability organizations, resilience engineering, HOP. Not that I believe there's any difference between any of them apart from titles. Oh, they have, um, yeah. But, <laughs> they're subtly different, but normally much the same. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so um, that's one of the biggest challenges that we have in, in getting people to to understand 
that there is that there are changes that we can do what we've done now in the industry up until now has been good enough to get us where we are but does it allow us to to progress yep. to innovate to be adaptive to be resilient those sort of things yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so we think about the the challenges that we have you probably had similar challenges yourself you know um, implementing these principles uh, with COVID nineteen, yeah. Oh, like with COVID or with the safety? no. I mean, I mean, you know, the the, the principles of, yeah. of high reliability and, and absolutely so on. Yeah. Well, people people don't like to think that there's something better than what they were already using. That's always a challenge. Leaving behind something uh, outcome biased. Is a, is a term that I use. You know, if things don't go wrong, we it's use it quite frequently. It has to be fixed. So we, yeah, I, I use the term outcome bias quite frequently um, with with some of our safety messages. You now I could be driving from Abu Dhabi to Ruais on a Sunday morning, and I'm doing 160 kilometres an hour, and someone will pass me doing 180 or 200. And they'll even pass you, they'll pass you on the inside or they'll pass you on the hard shoulder. And you think, well, why do, you, why do we do this? Is driving 100 miles an hour for 300 kilometers safe? And they usually say, well, okay, so what is it that makes it safe? Would driving 120 kilometers be safer? Yeah, yeah, it would be, yeah. So so as we then start talking about trade-offs that you make. Safety for time and, and so on. But I said, well, why is it that you continue to drive 160 kilometer, kilometers an hour when you know it's unsafe? He said, well, I've not had an accident. And that's, that's what happens. You know, if you continue, sadly, you can predict, you can imagine, with people traveling at 160 kilometers an hour uh, on a Wednesday afternoon at 3.30 when people are racing to get back, whether it be a, a two and a half hour journey to Abu Dhabi or a three and a half hour journey to, to Dubai or five or six hour journey, journeys to Alain or Ras Al Khaimah, that they're focusing on on many different things other than what they should be focusing on yeah um, absolutely i've seen we've seen two accidents uh, that have, have had resulted in fatalities as well mm. um, so. i think yeah there's a that's that's a very very interesting point yeah is uh driving at 160 kilometers an hour any worse than driving at 100 kilometers an hour uh is the accident going to be the same it might be similar, but it might have very different outcomes. It might, instead of impacting uh, two cars, it might then impact four or five cars or something like that. So it's yeah. a very, very interesting question to put out there. Um, especially, yeah, when you add that uh, get home itis, time pressure, a little bit of fatigue, um, starting to switch off after a long week at work. And uh, yeah, that could definitely increase the risk there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, can so how I, are we doing? Can I ask Any you questions? <laughs> yeah. Oh, look, mate. I have I have written down uh, quite a few questions, which I'm going to. Okay. If you don't mind, I'm going to ask you. Can I ask? So, yeah, you've actually surprised me a little bit. Um, as an outsider, having never worked, uh, I'm in Australia. We have a nuclear industry, but it's uh, it's one reactor down in uh, down in Sydney, uh, which I've never had anything to do with. And it's really only there for mainly medical purposes. It's not a power station. Medical purpose, yeah. Yeah, it's just yeah. Uh, for the isotope sort of side of things. Um, never been in, I've never re really even had anything to do with nuclear safety. But I would assume from an outsider that is, that is heavily regulated and heavily procedural, procedurally driven. Okay. Um, yep. 
Now, you're, this is great. What you're saying is, is outstanding because you're now coming in from the human performance side of things and, and changing the world, which is great. And that's what high uh, reliability organizations really need. Um, is, is it still heavily, heavily regulated and procedurally driven or is it starting to wind back and look at the human more? Is it actually working? So it's still, it is still very heavily proceduralized. Um, the main reason for that, my belief, is is that uh, now I, I have to step back a little bit. Step back a little bit. My opinions are now coming from where I am now, working with a lot of Americans, establishing their way, their work processes. That's what they're trying to do. Um, the American way is very heavily proceduralized based my opinion uh, a commonly held opinion that it's because of of the very very um lit litigious society sure. that they operate in um if it's not if there's no procedure for it then then we need a procedure to, just to cover our arses um so so i work very closely with a with a guy um, John Merrill, his name, a uh, colleague of mine. John was the human performance lead for Westinghouse for a number of years, the international um, human performance manager. And we have very, very, very similar views. Um, the difficulty that we, we have as an industry is how, how do you step back? So I, I regularly in these workshops, so I, I deliver the normal nuclear safety culture workshops. I deliver also a session which is part of a leadership program. The leadership sessions are always far more fun. The other ones are always good fun, but the leadership programs are really far more fun because I'm able then to, I, I start by telling them that I'm not going to teach them anything. I, all I'm going to do is ask them to, question their own views and opinions. So I ask, you know, safety, what does safety mean to you? I had a guy, the workshop, um, probably only six weeks ago. This is, this is a man who, who throughout his 40 years of, of nuclear experience has risen to the heights as a, a plant director. He left the position as plant director and went to the head of NATO, the head of the, the World Nuclear Association. Um, he had senior positions at IMPO. And when asked that question, what, is, what does safety mean to you? His response was, well, um, you know, when, when work is carried out and, and it's it's uh, there's there's no event then they're safe. Okay, okay, so all right, fine. So I pulled the chair over, put one foot up on the chair, and said, "Well, if I stand on this chair, is that safe?" He said, "No, of course it's not." I said, "Well, if I stand on the chair and step down, by by your judgment, that's it was a safe act." And he said, you know, in 40 years, he said, I've never, ever been challenged on that. So you've now changed my view of, of safety forever. Um, but it, it, it's when you, when you question, challenge views and opinions, um, simple, simple things, you know, just normal behaviours. Um, I ask, I ask, we, we have issues with, procedures at the moment. The writing, the, the difficulty is the plant is the Korean plant. Korean design, Korean, it's modeled on another plant in Korea, yeah. uh, Korean construction, and it's going to be operating to American standards. Whoever thought that that was going to be an easy thing to do was <laughs> going to be crazy. Yeah. Um, so, so there's really real difficulty when you look at you take the original Korean procedures. 
and you talk to the Koreans, you know, do you do you follow procedures? Yeah, yeah, of course we do. Do you really follow procedures? Well, no, because our manager tells us what we have to do. Oh, the procedure yeah. is there as a guide. Because that's 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 that high power distance way of working. You know, you're given instruction and, and you respect the view that the person who's giving you the instruction knows what they're talking about. Uh, so so their procedures are very, very superficial. Then you take the American requirement to have you know, every single action proceduralized. It, it makes it so, so difficult it would. For, for both parties. So another interesting, I, I quite often get procedure writers into the workshops. And, and I always... Uh, I enjoy having some fun, and I ask I'll ask them to to very quickly write me a procedure, make a a peanut butter sandwich, a peanut butter and jam sandwich. Right. You wouldn't believe some of them. You, know, you got two minutes, and some of them they they unscrew in an anti clockwise direction, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And then the, you have the guy from Romania who says, uh, in the cupboards you will find all the equipment and um, ingredients you need to make a peanut butter sandwich. That's it. Yeah. Basing the fact that you know what a peanut butter sandwich requires. And, and, um, and that's the challenge we face. So typically, UK, and the further, further east you go, in Europe, less proceduralization. Yeah. Um, in America, very heavily proceduralized. But the industry in America, uh, IMPO itself, has thrown out some challenges, questions, as to whether or not this is an effective way to train people to simply follow procedures. And, and that's so true. So do you train them? Uh, the way we do it is we train people to know the system, whatever that system may be, whether it's a technical system or a people system. And yes, like all Queensland and New South Wales in Australia and Victoria are, are extremely litigious as well uh, because of our workplace health and safety policies. But, um, and yeah, of course, we are required to follow the procedures to the letter. Uh, which we're having, which we're having problems with, because <clears throat> you and I both know that these days we should be looking at the human. The human is the solution. Okay, sometimes the procedure may not be 100% effective, or it might have some sort of problem, or they might miss a step in that procedure. Uh, and because they they, they are just literally check, ticking off a checklist, uh, they may get it wrong, and it, and it leads to an issue, like your guy before with the indicator light. Um, are you guys? getting into that that knowing the system based approach at all like if you were to go to your guys and say explain to me how the item that you're working on now works do you do that kind of thing so so they're beginning to do that yes good yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they are beginning to do that whether they do that as as uh, well and effectively as they should do um, if you're relying on the on the procedure all the time, it it can make you become complacent, and you do you lose knowledge. Of it doesn't stay with you if you don't if you don't use it. You don't you will lose it. Um, so that that's always a challenge for for the industry. And um, I've got to be honest, I've not had a lot of involvement with with the um, the simulator training. I used to in the UK which was inter really interesting because we would throw all sorts of, of issues outside of the procedure at, at the trainees during their annual um, assessments and see how they deal with it. Um, and and that does, as you say, that requires people to understand the, the system. When you, you think about um, your, your industry, you know, Sully, if he didn't yeah. know the system, what would he have done? If he'd followed the procedure, 
hundreds of thousands of people may have died. Absolutely, yeah, yep. But um, so, he he was a guy who knew the system really well, knew the aircraft really well, knew the air traffic control system well, knew the weather. Uh, was instantly able to judge what the the Hudson River was like and what it was doing, and was able to make a very quick decision based on what he knew. Yeah, yeah. And he yeah. went didn't he went outside of the procedure, didn't he? Because he started the APU straight away, without even using the checklist. Yeah. And that's I can't yeah. remember what it, that's somewhere down deep into the checklist. That's great thinking. That's that's a, a successful outcome, right? Out of a, for a uh, unfortunately for a quarter. Um, unsuccessful situation where they crashed a plane. So yeah, yeah, it shows how important it really is. And and that's, that's where for me, these, these new ways of, I say new ways, they're not new ways at all. You know, high reliability, resilience engineering, hop, safety two. The, The principles behind them have always been there, but industry has tended to, to go a different way. And, so I, I talk to the guys now, and, and I will ask, what percentage of, of work that your, your people do is successful? And they'll say, well, I don't know, 99, 99.5%. So, this, so we've only got that, that half a percent to, that we can, we can look back on. Do we really get a, an understanding of, of what, what may have gone wrong with that? Well, no, not really, not really. So, 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 what are we doing to to look at the good work? You know, then we start talking about blue line, black line, and and so on. And I just I ask the question: So, is it that we're really good, or are we just very lucky? What's uh, and, uh, how how are you? How do you measure safety? And what is uh, what is your reporting culture like? So very archaic. Um, I, I haven't got a I haven't got a cup. One of our cups here. Um, we issued we issued some cups, and, and I every time the the guys the other guys in our in our team they, they really rid me because of I'm I'm absolutely dismayed. You know, we're celebrating seventy five million safe man hours. And issued everyone with a cup to celebrate seventy-five million safe man hours. I, so at the workshops, I, I will ask, "Do you believe this?" And they say, no, no. So no, no way, no cuts or scratches. No one fell over. No broken legs. No head injuries in that seventy-five million hours. So what are they measuring? I don't know. I can't find out. I can't find out. But sadly, sadly, we are still targeting zero. Uh, yeah, that's bad. We all know that's a very bad, bad way to go, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, we still have bonuses that are, are dependent upon some of our safety, safety metrics. So that's very, yeah, very, very old school. And is that the American culture doing that? Yeah. 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 And how do you yeah. feel? How do you feel about that? You're start, beginning to sound like one of one of the guys I work with. <laughs> you winding me up. Yeah, it, for me, I just wish I just wish that that you know we could start to to listen and understand that there are other ways. Um, now, I've I've had I've had one of one of the site VPs who came to our workshop and said, "Well, you really knew, really do need to put more of a positive spin on it." Why? Yeah, to be fair, you, you do you do have to be careful. It's not necessarily a place where a just culture becomes natural. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of scary, isn't it? You need you need to uh, you need to get your managers to listen to the first like dozen episodes, I guess, of uh, Todd Conklin's pre accident investigation podcast, and then they might they may come around because they they certainly changed my life. But yeah. That's, yeah. That's incredible that in, in the nuclear industry, that culture is still surviving. Yeah. I mean, it is. Uh, you know, but don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. It's, a, it's extremely safe. 
Yeah, I, I have no doubt. There, there, are, there are events that, that occur. Um, as an industry, we are, we are probably, we do ourselves more injustice because we keep talking about safe nuclear, safe this, safe that, safe this. You know, if pe people kept talking about safe airlines, safe aircraft, you wonder, you, you wonder, well, are they really safe then? <laughs> so, um, when you think about how many nuclear power plants are around the world operating? Uh, 400. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have to, I'll be perfectly honest, I always have to have a, a little bit of a, um, with that as well, because many of them are in countries that wouldn't share any information if things went wrong anyway. Um, but it, it, is, it is safe. But just because it's safe, that doesn't mean that it's really good. It means that we may be just very lucky. And that's the bit that they don't understand. Yep. That's, uh, that's, we need to understand whether we're lucky or good. We don't know that. Yeah, so here I am. We're, we're, I'm talking about just your normal slips, trips, falls, broken arms, you know, uh, head injury, that sort of thing, which happen in any workplace. But now we're relating it to the nuclear industry where the consequences of uh, worst case scenario going wrong are, are massive. Oh, um, yeah. Because you've, you've got a radiation event which affects thousands and uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of people for the next 20,000 years. So yeah. I guess we need, to, we need to make sure that a system that controls that side of the game is foolproof. And yeah. is it? Like, uh, is it is it at, like prone to human error? I don't know. So, the, the reality of these nuclear power plants, the design, is such that if things go wrong, you can step away. They will look after themselves. Yeah, yeah. For the for the first part. Now, any degradation within the system over time can go unnoticed. So what you may be relying on today, you may not be, real, be able to rely on tomorrow or next year or five years time. Um, and it's, it's those things that we have to make sure that, that you know, because of the consequences. Now you think about um, Fukushima Daiichi and the ongoing problem that they're having with contaminated water going into the Pacific. Right. going into a massive, massive pool of water. So, so it's, it's of no real consequence. Now, what happens if that goes in, if we have a similar situation here and contaminated water leaked into the, into, into the, the Gulf. Persian Gulf? Yeah, yeah. Um, Which is a lifeline uh, for such a, a massive area, yeah. All of the Arab states. Yeah. yeah. All of the Arab states are around the Gulf. Um, I, I always ask. Uh, bottles of our, all of our water, drinking water is bottled. Bottled drinking water, where does this come from? It's all desalinated. All of our drinking water is desalinated water. Uh, what about the oil? What about the, the wealth of this country? Where is that? You know, well, that's that's out, in, out in the Gulf under uh, a three metre crust of of rock. Um, what if that becomes contaminated? So it's you know the 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 worst case scenario is very much a worst case, you know, and, and it's but but there are many things that need to be done to make sure that all the measures in place are, are the measures that are supposed to be in place and they're not deteriorating. Okay. We've, we've gone through a period over the course of the last 12 months um, and I've, I've raised issues with, with my director, uh, no, with our, with our VP, that, that the, the, the language that is used, we talk about schedule, 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 safety, schedule, 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 now, and, and and we, we do have an imbalance. And when they say, you know, well, yeah, those are the messages that are going out. But 
is that the message that the guy at the sharp end actually hears when he's when he's faced with a, a problem that that he knows how he can fix it he knows how he can work around it but but is that you've what got, you really want him to do yeah you've got to stay on schedule so yeah i might not have the time to do anything about it yeah so he's, yeah he's had a, so I'll, I'll say to the, the line managers and was, you imagine a guy comes back to you and says that this procedure is wrong we need to change it you'll say well done congratulations well done good job you stopped the next day he comes back again with another procedure say, this procedure is the same well done good job good job the third day he comes back and says, look this procedure is the third one in a row what again what's he going to do on the fourth time no, he's not going to go back there. Yeah. He's not going to go back. That's he right. Won't go back. Yeah. Hmm. That's a very interesting setup. Yeah. Hey, what's um, in your opinion? What's the difference between uh, nuclear safety culture and any other safety culture for any other high reliability organisation, whether it be aviation, construction, healthcare, whatever? It's a it's a name that we have to use. For me, safety culture is, is the way that, that that particular element of, of work is, or uh, no, it's not work, those particular aspects are dealt with within the, with the normal culture of the organization. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the way I see it. Yeah. It's, it's not something separate. Um, I, when, don't know if, if I, I don't know if I said it on that. That um, session last week, it, I probably didn't, but we, we went through a significant change on our plant over the course of about eight years. And we, we were at one time, we were, this was about 2002, we were very unlucky, as we thought. Lots of unplanned reactor trips, um, reportable events, only minor, but you know but they were reportable events they, they fitted into that category and so we sought some help and we got some help from from outside um, utilities we put together a team and they came and they told us where we were where we were going wrong and they they made it quite clear that it's not a case of being unlucky it's a case of being very very very, very poor arrogant as we were and and so on we we did a lot of work and this was the stuff we started talking about human performance Human performance was uh, the program was a contributory factor to the turnaround. Um, my then plant director said, "Well, come on, what's 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 the benefit of this stuff that you're delivering? Where's where's my return on investment?" And I said, "Well, just think of it like a contraceptive, Les. If you don't if you don't do it, what might happen?" And he said, "Okay, <laughs> all right." But we, we did, you know, that was just part of, of the contribution to changing it around. And then one day in, in 2010, they said to me, said, well, yeah, we've, we've taken our eye off of safety. We're not focusing on it at all now. Um, your, your frown was the same as mine at that time. Said, what do you mean? What do you mean? Yeah. He said, well, he said, Safety is coming along as a byproduct of doing everything else right, which it was. We were people were doing things the right way. Um, the the business benefits were phenomenal. Um, we we turned it as a business. We didn't maintain that, and there was there was some, once we got up started to plateau and then then dropped down, um, started to tear to deteriorate, so that. It was after I'd left, but in 2015, 2016, our plant had to do some significant, make some significant changes to, to uh, get back up to where they were, yeah. where they had been. Was there an accident or something that, that was the um, catalyst for that change? Or what, what was the catalyst for that change? I, it, was, it was drift and then recognising the drift. So there was, a, was there a lot of uh, like that normalization of deviance happening? Was it yeah. that sort of thing? Yeah. And yeah. No, 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 no big issues. 
Yeah, but, but eventually you had the you had the right people come along. He put their hand up and went, "Hey, we need to look at how we're doing." Something's not business. as not yeah. as good as it was. Things need to change. We need to yeah, get good. back on track. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's encouraging, isn't it? But uh, yeah, it's a it's a concern when it doesn't doesn't stay that way. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> what about so, what? About, uh, oh, sorry, no. More yeah, questions. Come on. More questions. We've got more questions. Carry on. <laughs> What about uh, what about risk management? Actually, sorry, there is one one question I had from that last bit. Does uh, your company, your uh, I guess that this is probably run by a bunch of different organisations. I'm not sure. Is there a safety motto? Ours, ours in in the Air Force, uh, capability first, safety always. Do you guys have some sort of motto that that you share? Safety first, safety first, last, and always. Okay, yeah. So what they say. Yeah. I, I wish they believed it. <laughs> what, do, what do you think of that, that motto? Do you like it or dislike it? Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not a great fan of mottos. I'd rather, I'd rather see action, see things being changed rather than these, these mottos. And, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, we, um, being a military, you know, we, yeah, we love mottos and we love our, our TLAs, our three-letter acronyms. Um, but, uh, no, don't talk to me about acronyms. <laughs> but, um, yeah, ours, ours is capability first, safety always. And we've actually had uh, – that, and that raises some eyebrows as well, depending on the audience and who you're talking to. So we actually asked one of our – we had the, the, uh, the uh, our old chief of Air Force in the room one day and said, hey, so what, what do you think of our current motto? And he said, all right, that's a good question. What do you guys think about it? And we said, oh, there's some people out there, you know, like, you know, asking for a friend kind of thing that think capability first, like being capability being uh, putting fast jets in the air and, and uh, heavy aircraft in the air and dropping bombs on a target and providing air power and all that, all those sort of things uh, first. And safety comes along as a secondary thing. And uh, he actually came out and said, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm aware that people think that, but uh, we can't, we definitely can't think that way. Um, as, as a military, we can't, if we operated safely all the time, we probably wouldn't fly at all. You know, we'd probably just fly around the flagpole or something because that's reasonably safe. Uh, we're definitely not going to fly long missions and carry weapons and all that sort of stuff. So we need to have safety Right? But in order to do that, we need to have capability. The capability has to come first. We're not a, we're not a flying club. We have a mm. job to perform. You know, it has yeah. to protect it's Australia wrong. and its national assets and interests, um, and just as any military does. But um, that, that and, and explaining it that way to people, they, 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 it's like the pennies dropped. Ah, oh, that actually makes sense now. Yes, we have to have that capability, but safety has to come in to be involved in every single part of that, that process so that um, we can provide that capability. Um, so when you say yours, can you, what, sorry, what was it again? Um, so it re recently changed. We always used to say safety is our number, nuclear safety is our number one priority. Okay. But as you say, you know, how can that be? If it was, if nuclear safety was our number one priority, we wouldn't keep these plants running. We'd shut them down. You'd probably be burning oil or coal, yeah. Because because there's a risk. <laughs> That's right. And and it's a you know it's a you know the potential risk is is very high, um, or the consequence is high. But um, safety, safety first, last, and always is okay. is what they say. Um, yeah, but I don't I don't like them. Yeah, I'm not a I'm not a great fan of of mottos and. Mm. And so on. Cat, I would rather, races. I'd rather see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had, we had one guy. Um, he joined us as a chief nuclear officer in that would have been August, no April, April twenty eighteen. He joined us, and he came and opened up a workshop for us. We we invited him to come and open up a workshop. Shame we had to invite him. Actually, you know, it would have been good for him to say, you know, can I come? Yeah. Um, but but he came and he spoke and I thought wow this guy is this guy is really really good really really good and over the course of the of the, the following nine to ten months 
I heard that same speech so many times. It just meant absolutely nothing. Um, and 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 it you know it made it quite clear where his priorities were. We have to we have to be. You know, I'll be really really critical of the industry. Um, if if nuclear safety was a number one priority, we wouldn't run. In the states, all these nuclear power plants are operated by independent companies. Their priority is to make money. And over the time, of certainly since about two, 2003, 2004, there have been certain elements of the industry in, in America that have uh, cut, 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 and they've reduced the safety margin down, 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 down to, to a, a fairly bare minimum. Um, and quite some of the, some of the stories are we, we talk we use a case study uh, Davis Bessie. Have you ever heard of Davis Bessie? No, no. Uh, Davis Bessie. Uh, I've, I've been fortunate that Davis Bessie was a, a plant that um, they found in two thousand and two corrosion had caused the, the a hole in the reactor pressure vessel head. Now this is 150, 160 millimeters of carbon steel reactor pressure vessel head, about 15, 15 feet, about five meters in diameter, 150 millimeters uh, the dome, and all the control rods run through it. Um, and the control rods are, they have a, a guide nozzle which is made of an alloy, Incan L600 alloy, mm -hmm. and but the, these alloys alloy guide nozzles were susceptible to cracking, heat stress related cracking. And so you, you have very high pressure inside the pressurized water reactor would cause seepage. That would come out and, and the boronated water would flash off leaving boric acid crystals. The inside of the reactor is, is lined with stainless steel to protect it from the, protect the carbon steel from the boronated water. And, and their maintenance processes meant that, that their focus was on shortest outages possible, like 24 days, where most plants were 36, 40 days. And so, so they were focusing on, on maximizing the profit. And their target was breaker to breaker runs, you know, the end of one outage to the beginning of the next outage without stopping making as much money as possible. And it was a whistleblower in the end who reported to the NRC that the, the processes, practices ongoing that, that would, had the potential, so a potential to cause, the da cause damage. Um, not knowing at that time, because this, this was in, in 2000, late 2001, early 2002, the whistleblower contacted the NRC, the, the regulator in the States, and they shut the plant down. They shut the plant down to carry inspections of the reactor pressure vessel head. And during these inspections, they found that there was a hole the size of a pineapple, about that big. And the only part of the, of the boundary that was left, the pressure boundary, was the stainless steel liner. Four millimeters thick stainless steel. Oh. Yeah. And what would have been the outcome of that if that breached? Uh, well, there was cracking in it already. Cracking and distortion in it already. Um, so, so the reality, you, you postulate, how much longer would it have gone without, without a severe uncontrolled leak of reactor contents? Uh, the reality probably would have caused, um, there, was, there was so much boric acid in the environment of boronated, boric acid crystals in the environment that they would have caused some, some blocking of the sump. So you'd ended up, ended up losing your cooling pumps. Losing your cooling pumps would have resulted in meltdown area. Yeah, yeah. Um, but why was that? You know, so talking to the guys, I was fortunate, fortunate enough to, to meet four or five guys who'd actually worked there at the time. 
and one of them was a reactor operator, senior reactor operator, an SRO. And I said to him, I said, well, did you know what was going on? He said, yeah, of course I did. Well, why didn't you do something about it? He said, you, you need to understand. He said, I was taken into a room and I was made, it was made very, very clear to me that it was more than just my job that I was, I had the, the potential to lose. Now, you know, I've thought about it after, what did he mean by that? In, in livelihood, future opportunities for employment within the nuclear industry, they could have blackballed him. And, and he, I said, well, so why didn't you say something? He said, I don't know. I, don't know. I asked myself that every single day. And this is like 10 years, 10, 12 years later. That's why didn't you do something about it? Mm. Um, one of the, the, the culture was, was so, so, we talk about a chilled environment. Uh, we have we have a program, safety conscious work environment program. Um, it's not always as good as it should be, but uh, it was something that, that was certainly strengthened within the industry with a, a, a specific program to support the safety conscious work environment being being introduced. But um, that was just a, a real culture story, a real you know, a meaty cultural story. Yeah, is that um, so? so it, that has been investigated. Is there information like available oh, on that? It's all all available. Oh, yeah, like, you oh, go, Google. Yeah, Davis Davis Bessie. Nice. No, thank you. I'll have to GTS that one for sure. So, yeah. what about um? Uh, that's really really interesting. It's a very, it's it's kind of scary. What about uh? both the proactive and the reactive side. So proactively, is there a, um, what's the risk management culture like? Oh, and on the other side, what is the investigation culture like when things do go wrong, if they are investigated whatsoever, considering you said there were 75 million man hours that, uh, <laughs> that were accident free, apparently. Yeah. Um, so, is is there what is the risk culture? Um, we have a, a lot of a lot of academics who are employed who talk about uh, risk probability. Um, from from a, a, a reality perspective, you know, the guy the guy who who screws up on a lockout tagout activity. That results in in someone uh, being electrocuted. Mm -hmm. Possibility. Um, how how are those? So yeah, risk assessments are carried out. The the Koreans are becoming much better than they were. Um, we still don't understand the reasons. We still have a, a very very strong drive for root cause analysis. Um, and, and I keep saying, you know, let's just change the language. Let's call it a causal analysis. Then we're not limit, limiting it to one root cause. One, yeah, that's which right. Is, which, is, which is where we tend to be. Um, and the language, the, it's the lang language that we use within our procedures is, is also very limiting. Um, if we think about our our procedures. I'm trying to I'm trying to picture bits in particular. Uh, our at site we have some our corporate values at site. The acronym. Uh, first one accountability. And and the little booklet says you must you must you must you will you shall you must you must you must. So what if I don't? What if I don't? It certainly infers that I'm going to be punished. And those, that type of language that we, that we use in the West in particular leads us to blaming the human. Mm. We, get to the, we get to the human. You know, um, we're working with different cultures. You find typically, it's not, it's not 
always, but typically, you know, um, a pencil it falls on the floor. I knock it on the floor. What happened? Well, Phil knocked it on the floor, so Phil was to blame. You take us someone from the Latin cultures, they would they would say, you know, well, what happened? The pencil fell on the floor. Straight away, you've got two different routes for questioning. Mm -hmm. The pencil fell on the floor, or Phil knocked the pencil on the floor. So the first one is you've got to stop Phil from knocking the pencil on the floor. You've got to tell him, train him, beat him, whatever. The other way is, well, what can we do to stop it falling on the floor in the future? So we're, we're still some way behind where, where I want us to be. I would hope that we could be. I, we have, we have a, lot of, a lot of people to try to influence. And it's not easy. It's not easy. Yeah, absolutely. Especially when you're working in a in a top heavy organisation, it's yeah, yeah. You've got a lot of people to influence. Uh, a lot of them, their their major influences are shareholders and the customers, and are not so much interested. But the thing that scares me the most in just about any any of any situations, because like what you're saying, uh, is very very similar to some things that happen in the aviation world, uh, in the mining world. In Australia, we mine coal and natural gas a lot. And there's still mm -hmm. a lot. They, they they would have the same conversations, yeah, that, that you and I are having. Some yeah. are really good at it. Some are have still got some work to do. But um, <clears throat> it's it, it it all comes down to how how they manage that. Um, there will always be that battle between production and safety, hundred yeah. percent. Production uh, so, prevention. Absolutely. Yep. And how do we manage that? And I think what, what you're doing in the human performance side of things is, is without, without doubt these days, the best avenue to try to, to, try to do that. Um, but uh, yeah, as you said, you're coming, coming up against some roadblocks, but you'll still continue trying. I have no yeah. doubt. Yeah. So, so for me, you know, we, we did touch on it. Uh, safety two, HROs, resilience engineering, HOP, Mm -hmm. The difference between them is there a difference between them? <sighs> there is, there are differences, but I think what we're trying to do, we're trying to to apply elements of of all of them, different differing elements of all of them, in trying to improve what we do um, to to improve the learning of the organisation. You know, we we are not a learning organisation. You said about invest investigating events. We still use human performance clocks to, 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 I'm not sure. I still, I still believe that people think that they're, they're there to beat people with. They're <laughs> a measure of bad performance. Um, and because of that negativity in my old plant in the UK, uh, station director said, no, 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 we're not going to have those. They're, they're not going to provide us with any real benefit. And he was right. He was right. Um, but, so we had a, a human performance clock reset in March, March or May of last year, and that was attributed to a number of, of lockout tiger events. And some six months later, I asked the question of our, of our team with our director: well, "What have we learned as an organisation? What have we learned about those?" We call it, we call it human performance errors, and and our CNO sent a communication out said that that uh, it was a communication that was prepared by our manager. The CNO added a little bit onto it, and he said that the individuals concerned have been identified, their line managers have been uh, informed, and they will be dealt with appropriately. And you think, wow, jeez, crazy. Crazy. Uh, so, so um, we need to learn, and we need to learn from those activities that go on every day. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the guy, the guy, whether that's a, whether that's a, a guy operating plant, a guy maintaining plant, or an admin assistant 
who's who's working in the, the central offices in in Abu Dhabi. They all can have an impact, and you know, yeah. they don't necessarily see it. And that's part of our our ongoing challenge, getting them to recognise that they actually do contribute. So here you are doing an abs- abs- absolutely outstanding job. I have no doubt training. I would say thirty two people a week. In an, yeah. an organisation that has twenty different cultures, uh, no, sixty. Oh, sixty. Okay, more than that. Six, yeah, sixty. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, you got a lot of work ahead of you, right? Um, it, how do you? How do you? Um, let me ask you: Do you concentrate that effort on the workers, or management, or both? How do you? How do you break that down? So, so for me. Um, I'm, I'm where, where we are at the moment, I'm focusing on the leadership. I need to get the leaders, the line managers, to understand why we want learning teams and why we don't want them in the learning teams initially. Some, are, some I know were fine, they'll be, they'll be fine, they'll be good. Um, getting them to understand that people don't always follow procedures why don't they follow procedures? We want to understand the realities of work. What are the challenges that the guys face on a daily basis? The work that's finished well, finished successfully, was it Was it because we're really good or because we're just very lucky? Mm. We need to understand that. Where are the potential hotspots in the future? Then I'm, I'm working also with with groups for them to understand how improving their processes. You know, what are, what are the challenges they face within their system? What are the, the shortcomings they face within their system? Um, getting them to understand because these are the people that work with the system on a daily basis. So they, they know where the, the problems are. Um, and typically it's a, the, a manager several steps up up the ladder, or a project manager who sometime at some point has specified, this is what we're going to be doing. This is what what's needed, without really understanding the requirements of the business. So working with with groups of people, hate uh, with HR finance. Yeah. You know, they all they all have their role to play. They all have deficiencies in their systems that that lead to errors, errors that can. I'm dealing with, with some at the moment because our, our do you use SAP in, in Australia as a, sound, a people people management system? Doesn't sound familiar, but uh, in the Air Force we use our own systems. But yeah, I'm sure it's out there. Yeah, yes. What, so, what, is it, what does so, it stand for? Uh, systems attributes and I know so it's a German tool, but okay. it's pretty well, pretty widely used now uh, as a people management tool. And that's used for the hum- for the HR side of things, but it transfers data to a different tool, which is used for the training compliance monitoring. And and my current issue at the moment is that if if I am a regulator, and I request to look at information regarding a particular individual from our training compliance monitoring tool. And I see that the supervisor that you have listed within within your compliance monitoring monitoring tool actually left the organisation a year ago. I think, well, whatever. How how can I be be confident that this is telling me accurate information? And that's the situation we have. And it's getting them to understand that that these are things that can the regulator can say right. That's it until you can prove to us. That your data is accurate, then we want you to shut down. Yeah. And that's that happened. That's happened many, many times in the states, in particular. Uh, the, probably the biggest cause is for for the NRC to step in and shut a plant down in the states have been training, training compliance, or chilled working environments. Can you explain that last one for me? To, to, um, uh, a, a, a failing of a, a lack of a just culture. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
a chilled environment in the classroom, right. as they call it. Yep. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Do you have the uh, one of the one of the um, tenets for like a uh, under a good safety management system is genuine command commitment? Is what we call it. So a, a genuine buy-in from your managers. Do you have that in the in the safety space at all? Uh, so, so I'm I'm working. Uh, we are, we're separate in our industry. We're separate uh, in as much as um, nuclear safety encompasses industrial safety, radiological safety, security safety, yep. etc. Sure. So, industrial safety is. Something that's that's very very separate, but but you know, they're still very much like policemen, and, and it's about you know keeping the company compliant and preventing people from from having accidents. They're good people, but they still come from a, a behavioural based safety mm. background. Um, one or two of them are are progressive in their thinking, and. Uh, we're beginning to work with work with those in trying to to change views and opinions. Mm, okay, yep. it's like they say, yeah. right? Um, nobody it doesn't matter who you are. Nobody turns up at work to do a bad job. Everybody wants no. to come to work to do the best that they can and the best that they know. But yep. you know that uh, that event is the variation in normal performance. They don't. They don't. Want to have an accident, but uh, at some point they they do. So yeah, you've got guys that want to do the right thing, and I'm sure they're at every level, just trying to main uh, to maintain that and the, make the make split the system work. The split second before you cut your finger with a knife in the kitchen, you think you're doing the right thing. Totally, yeah. I say that to uh, one of the sections at my work is a is a hanger where air movements. So they build pallets in there and they put those pallets onto a, onto a loader and they load that onto an aircraft. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a fairly large hangar. And from mm -hmm. memory, it's probably got about um, a dozen poles in it that hold the roof up. And I, I don't know any of those poles that do not have dents in them from people running forklifts into them. <laughs> yeah. And none yeah. of them intend to do it. But yeah, that's, that's, uh, that happens it's, all the time. It's, it's normal. Absolutely. It's normal. And uh, you know, there's, there's usually some some sort of reason. I've had one occasion where I've I've had to go out. I've been instructed to go and find out why these people did what they did. And it was a, a, a security guard who reversed a quad bike into a, into a ditch that was full of water. And you, know, you think, well, well is, there, is there a weakness in the system? <laughs> No, he just screwed up. And sometimes that's, that, that is the reality of it. You know, he just screwed up. Uh, he, he made, he made a, a misjudgment in his calculations as, the, as the, the, the turning circle and the speed he was going and, and all those things. Yeah. Well, is it, is it just a screw up? Was, was, his, was he trained well enough to know not to speed in that sort of area? You know, those they, they sort of things. Oh, these are the things I always you know, think he'd, about. He'd been he'd been riding driving a quad bike around around this part of the site for, for a number of years, so, so it was he was well experienced with it. <laughs> and on that that particular occasion, he just made a, a bad a, a wrong decision. Bad judgment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Should no. we sack him for it? No, of course not. No, no. If you're going to sack the, the guy who knows how not to drive into a ditch, the best. Yeah. So that, that's you know. He made a mistake uh, when the when the the CEO is stood in front of all the staff, and he tells you that there are there are two hundred and thirty six days to to the day when we plan to be loading fuel, and he's thirty odd days out. He's made a mistake. Should be second for it. And people people still have the view. Well, yeah, but the consequences, you know, what. Yeah. Oh, he's failed. Yeah, we have to. No, he's failed. He's made a mistake. Yeah, that's, 
that's that's the culture that uh, unfortunately breeds around us, isn't it? It is. It is somebody's yeah. head. Yeah. Somebody's got to be accountable. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. So what? Uh, I think I've only got probably one or two more questions. Carry on. How do you? So you're as a safety. I don't know. What do you, what do you call yourself? A safety practitioner, I guess. Um, at your workplace, I, how, how do you make that sustainable in the future? Do you work with a team? Are you mentoring younger people? Uh, how, how are you going to maintain this safety rage um, after you've, you've retired and you're sitting on a beach somewhere comfortably? So, um, one of, part, part of the, the, the drive for the organisation is for this plant to be uh, an Emirati operated plant, operated and managed. So we're currently going through the process of putting senior people in place. Um, Emiratis by senior, I don't necessarily mean old. Uh, we we were recently um, in our team. We have a, a young Emirati who is now an assistant manager and talk very, very openly with him about resilience engineering and high reliability. And he knows what he's talking about. Um, we have a number within, within our, our nuclear performance improvement group, both, both the central team, which I'm part of, and, and the, the two plant teams that we have. Uh, a number of, of Emiratis there who only know what they've been told with regard to what we do. Mm -hmm. So uh, at the request of our, our director, I put together a, a training program. And you know, the training program, I pulled it straight out of an info document. And it's all about high reliability, hop, safety two principles. So I've, I've pulled that out, um, and they are all going through this program. Now this is this has disrupted it a little bit, so we're we're going to start with some virtual classrooms. We have a particular I have a particular issue with these virtual classrooms at the moment that we're trying to set up because certain parts of the plan you're not allowed to use a camera, which sure. means you cannot have a laptop that has a camera. So these people have laptops and no cameras. How can I, and I still struggle? How can I have a virtual classroom if I can't see the students? Mm. Yeah, I, uh, I, I need to be able to see the reaction when I say something. Yeah, you need to be able to gauge understanding, mm. and make sure they're not asleep, yeah. that sort of thing. Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A, that will be a challenge. And what about what about COVID nineteen? So that's um, how is how is it affecting the the work that you're doing at the moment? So, so the work that I'm doing at the moment, uh, I'm I'm writing some articles for publishing. Uh, I'm I'm preparing some some material for for these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. uh, Microsoft Teams we use within the company um, it has its challenges, but it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. Um, we as a as a team, it's it's pretty good. Um, or you can almost get a little bit, a little bit fed up with all of the positivity. Life's not full of positivity. <laughs> yeah, let's face reality. Life's shit at times. Um, but we, we uh, last night we did a, we had a, a Master Chef competition. Um, so we we presented our our, our offerings. The rest of the group are pretty disappointed. I, I know how these Master Chef contestants feel when when they've been kicked off. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's pretty pretty soul destroying, is it? Ah, uh, certainly is. When I when I saw the results this morning, ah, uh, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, so working working remotely is is working okay. So you know, there's there's a team of our our direct team is. Um, 10 people um, and our indirect team uh, all working remotely in various parts of the Emirates um, goes up to, to 30 or 40 people. Um, we don't 
speak, speak across the whole lot, to be fair. Um, the people on plant, what they've done now, um, the, the COVID-19, Dubai was identified with a number of hotspots. So D Dubai was effectively cordoned off. Certain parts of Dubai uh, were cordoned off internally. Um, typically where they, they have expat workers mm -hmm. who, who are um, the, the lower paid, put it that way, typically Indians, Bangladeshis, uh, Nepalese, mm -hmm. um, were sharing four, five, six to a room. Right. Lockdown yeah. isn't great for them. Yeah. Um, but they, and they found it's a lot of, a lot of um, cases in terms of testing, we've tested nearly 800,000, nearly a, a million people, 800,000 tests have been carried out. Wow, yeah, yeah. yeah. Phenomenal, phenomenal. Um, they've set up, I think there are six or seven drive-through testing facilities that, that can be used. Um, not, oh, I think it's about 8,000 cases now. Um, 40 something fatalities. Um, we have been on lockdown now for a month. Um, pretty strict with the lockdown. Night times, curfew between eight and six, where they're out uh, um, disinfecting the roads. Really? All, okay. all over the Emirates, yeah, dis disinfecting the roads. Um, now, because of, of the oil refinery at Ruwais, the biggest part of the population in race are people associated with the, the oil refinery. Probably only about two, two thousand, two and a half thousand associated with with Baraka and its four nuclear power plants. But Ruais has been cut off. Anyone that goes wishes to go into Ruais has to has to um, apart from the normal lockdown that we have. They, they have to be in quarantine for two weeks before they go and then tested and found to be not 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 carrying before they're allowed into Ruais. So people don't don't leave Ruais. Um, it's the same with the plant, getting onto the plant. So we have we've just gone through the first going through the first change of of workforce now many of the workforce would stay on site all the time anyway they have all the facilities food swimming pools uh, football courts dr golf driving ranges all that on site yep. because of the location so they they're fairly well looked after um, but they're going through now so so most of them would have most of the operating staff. I mean, it's probably a crew of about 200, 250 maybe, who are going through a change, and they're, they're going to be replaced for uh, probably, we're just starting Ramadan now, the religious period of Ramadan, yeah. which goes on for a month, uh, which is great because we only work from, we work six hour days, which is good. Um, so, so uh, uh, you've got to be nothing but impressed with the way the, the government here have, have uh, worked to it. manage it. Yeah. yeah, yeah um, there are some negative sides to it, but you know, it, it's really, it is really positive. And, and our, to be fair, our, our company people, you know, um, They've, they're doing very well in, in managing, controlling, allowing the work to continue because you know, we're not actually operating a, either of the four plants yet. We've only just loaded fuel in February in the first of them, uh, which was two years behind when they said they were going to be doing it. But there were, there were general reasons for, for that not happening. Um, so, yeah, really positive, really positive. Okay. Good. Yeah. No, very good. I think um, uh, there's a lot of people, like I, I talk to a lot of friends. Now, despite the fact that uh, this, this virus has its terrible implications, where there's fatalities and that sort of thing, a lot of people are actually enjoying it. <laughs> they're actually enjoying uh, the fact that they're able to spend 
all the time with their family with no pretty well no distractions they don't have to as much as i'm sure they want to visit family and friends they don't they're not allowed to so they just stay at home and they're just enjoying life with their families and a lot of people are like this is this is great i don't want to have to go back to work but of course one day we all will yeah, I feel the same. I feel the same. I'm enjoying. I'm enjoying it. A little bit frustrating at times. Um, we're supposed to be uh, locked down. You only go out for, for vegetables and, and pharmacy. Yep. Yep. I'm, I have to say that that's not necessarily the case. But we go out. Um, started to go out and, and walk. Um, so, are you allowed to exercise? There's no no formal allowing of exercise. Right. Okay. Yeah, we are for one hour a day. <laughs> so so we've started to go out and and we walk. So we've been out. And we walked for an hour and a half last night, eight kilometres, which is great. Yep. Um, but walking, you have to have a mask on, um, and you 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 keep your distance. You're very very wary. Everyone is also. Of the same mind, which is great. This is really good. Yep. Um, saving a lot of money, not mm-hmm. spending anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I, would, I would normally spend, uh, fill my fill my tank up three times a week in my Range Rover. But I bet. Um, yeah, it's been he's been sat outside. I start. I've, I did start him up last week just to make sure that he was still okay. So the heat over here. The heat over here in the summer actually kills the batteries in cars. Yeah. Um, last summer it was up to like 55. But, um, yep. Yeah. I'm, yep. I'm, 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 from a work perspective, I'm actually finding, I'm finding that um, I have far less distractions um, and, and I can, I can get, get things, things done. done. Yeah, yeah, me too. Well, actually, no, I tell a lot. I've got a two-year-old, so... That makes yeah. it a little bit difficult, but um, yeah. now it's good that you're getting three weeks to the gallon on your on your on your Range Rover. That's 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 it's great, it's and good. it's amazing now that yeah. they're actually uh, the oil companies are paying companies to take their fuel, their oil, because they can't sell it anymore. Nobody's using it, yeah. which is a very very interesting uh, world we're living in. But um, now on. So when when one of our colleagues was was asked about. Um, Neg- neg- the negative oil price. Yep. What does what does that mean? And he used an, an analogy: if uh, if you were to have booked an escort um, to 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 come to your apartment, and but before you so you paid your your five hundred dollars or whatever it is before they came, uh, we were forced into lockdown. So she couldn't come. The pimp has. A room full of a house full of women that, that no one wants, and, and he, it was quite a good analogy. I can't remember it all, but it's it quite... oh dear, now that's quite funny. Now, look, Phil, this has been really, really good, mate. Thank you. Um, have you got anything else you want to anything, any no, final no, no, things no, you want to say, mate? No, fine. No, I'm happy. Thank you very much for this, mate. It's been uh, well, uh, over two hours of uh, of, 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 of I think quite an interesting conversation. I really appreciate your time, mate. Uh, I, no hope, problem. I hope the people that listen to it, if they, if anyone decides to listen to it, enjoys it. But uh, look, mate, might, well, uh, I'll see you around. Thank you once again, and have a uh, have a great time. You're welcome, welcome. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed the conversation. Cheers, mate. Thanks, buddy. Bye-bye. 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 Bye bye. Bye bye.